because um, many some of you saw my talk yesterday. Uh, today we will kind of make the uh, next step. And uh, for this, I think it's, it's a good thing that we're not too many because I would love this to be a little bit of a seminar. If you have questions, chime right in. Uh, if you have any, uh, you feel like anything was uh, glossed over too fast, uh, happy to step back and explain this because in the end, we want to try to make a step forward in the development of this whole thing together. Uh, so that I'm not just going to be reporting on where we are, but hopefully uh, try to find out what might make sense for the next step. However, uh, getting started, I would like to just, uh, for the benefit of those who haven't been there yesterday or have never heard about the project before, um, I'd like to uh, start at the top, give you a little bit of a presentation. Uh, walk you through what Nexon is and uh, what, the, what the vision behind the whole thing is. Um, basically, um, yeah, we have a we have a, a situation right now where we're um, at a phase where. Um, Nick Zaho uh, even says that uh, smart contracts are not necessarily meant to be complex. Uh, they have a different focus, or at least that was the focus in the beginning that he had. And um, now that we're coming to a point where uh, we are uh, yeah, in a more mature environment than we had before, we should also be exact about what smart contracts actually, what smart contracts actually are, what they should be used for. And um, we have uh, Italic on record, who's basically saying, well, I can't regret I haven't called the smart contracts. Maybe we should have just called them sort procedures, something like that, and not actually in China. Um, I'm actually happy to uh, take out the mantle that they are dropping, where they're saying, okay, maybe smart contract was not such a good name for it, um, and explore what is possible, actually, with programs that are running on the blockchain and have certain features. And uh, to get into the mood, I hope we'll be able to switch. Um, yeah. Notoriously difficult to switch out of these um, presentations, I'm sorry. Uh, to to uh, start out, what I think um, is a bigger discussion here than maybe even just a discussion blockchain and smart contracts, and uh, to set the tone a little bit, I would like to try to give you a uh, video presentation, but I won't have it on. Ah, there you go. I don't have a sound system here, but We don't have sound, maybe I don't sing to it, but I, I can explain a little bit what the thoughts are. Obviously, the human brain, we have 16 billion cores just in our front row, uh, and they're all working in parallel, right? So what we have now, even uh, if we look at, uh, uh, depending on how you count, how many nodes, how many full nodes there actually are in the blockchain world, out in Ethereum, out in Bitcoin, uh, it's something that, of course, has nothing to do with what's going on in the real world. And the biggest computers at this point have 10 million cores. And that's actually only the most... Hey, hello. Come in, come in, guys. That's fine. That's, that's the most advanced computer. Right? 10 million cores. 16 billion. And every single brain on the planet. 7 billion times. So we have to ask how much power we are going to decide, what we can expect from artificial intelligence or from blockchain programs or whatever it is. The more so, the more we allow them to start becoming forces that rule our lives, or at least become a pretty big part of what our lives are. And of course we have to ask where this all comes from. Hey, hello. Thanks, you guys. Cool, cool. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> 
So I think where this actually is going is this tool that has its start, no doubt, on the blockchain might be the tool that we will need for taking it to robotic laws. And everybody knows from Asimo. Where we will have to find a way as a society to talk about it and then also to make laws about what robots, specifically autonomous robots, should be allowed to do. And this is something that also, like if we go beyond the bubble that we're all in here, right? I mean, it's wonderful to see all these familiar faces and so on, but uh, other, there are a lot of people who care about things and they do care about these kind of things now. That um, were not maybe uh, on the forefront of everybody's thinking when, uh, uh, when Ethereum started. But meanwhile, Facebook is not really considered a force of good anymore. Nobody's laughing anymore when Google says, do no evil. Do you guys even remember? What's the motto, right? But uh, I had this. This often uh, conversation yesterday about um, the difference and uh, what is going on in the illegal and how important it might be to have illegal concepts and forces in the blockchain world. And I was finding that actually it's a perpendicular, it's not really the same dimension that we're talking about. Lexon is not really about trying to be an alternative or do something else or invent a legal. Lexon is just proposing something else. But here's something I learned. When I was in the army, the rules are actually protecting the weak. And the more you might feel like you don't need no rules, and you're just being hampered by rules, well, maybe it just means you're pretty strong. But I think one of my favorite is that when we talk about society, um, I don't see a 1% problem, I see a 10% problem. And that is the 10% that most of us are in, who don't have much contact with 9%, who are not as privileged as we are. Uh, and that probably means every single person here in this world. So, yeah, code is law. <laughs> Maybe the powerful are laughing about it, right? Um, it's, it's becoming interesting, and you also said that, I mean, for me, like the DAO, the, the interesting thing with the DAO was that actually, um, it was code as law, right? And then, oh, and then the code had a bug. And then all of a sudden you didn't only have, okay, law as code, code as law, the spirit of the law, the spirit of a contract, but all of a sudden you had the spirit of the code. Because that was what the DAO was actually meant to do, but didn't. But everybody understood what that was, right? And so the decision was about, okay, so did we now try to divine what the spirit of the code had been? And yes, obviously that happened, right? So it was hard for it. To make the bug go away and make the spirit of the code be the code, which is an interesting way of how to solve mushrooms into uh, more and more complex ways to, to look at this whole um, problem of hard to read or hard to debug smart contracts. Now, the problem for Lex obviously was that, well, we don't like do accounting like with bits and bytes, right? Just because the computer knows only bits and bytes, that's not how we do accounting, because we know it's difficult. To can't have a bug in that. And so we have created languages and we have created programs that can do better. And so this is Lexon now. Uh, this is a program, and that's the point, right? Uh, it has actually gone further than I thought in the beginning possible because um, I thought you will always have to make some compromises. You will have to explain to people that a colon has a very specific meaning in this context. But actually, it's been Brian Fox who pushed me into optimizing it uh, on the readability side. And now, I would say, to me, this is like really zero learning hurdle. And this is where we are right now, where you can say, OK, uh, anybody can read this and understand what this is supposed to mean. And that is the point. Because you can also compile it, put it on the blockchain, and a smart contract, and it runs. And it took a bit to get there. It also is not quite clear how far it will actually get. So there's still research going on. Uh, it's, it's a long road to understand how long it really need it, how they want it, what makes it be a contract to them. Although there's other stuff where naively looking at this, people who are not in the legal profession uh, might doubt whether this is actually a contract. But 
lawyers will usually tell you, yeah, that's absolutely a contract. You can, it's not about the beauty of the language for something to be a contract. But a contract is not thrown out of the door because it's not grammatically 100% correct for stuff like this, right? So, and what I would like to get at today is whether this could work, right? Because why stop with English? Next one is a big exercise in uh, democratization, and actually I'm really trying to target this intermediate program. Every good engineer does that, trying to make himself super fluid. And Vitalik has actually uh, told me that, oh, I, mean, I think it makes us explicit, that he wanted to empower the programmers. That was the objective for Ethereum. And I'm curious how far we can push this, and how far beyond uh, being a tool for programmers as this, but I'm also curious how far we can push it, how far beyond English we can take this. And I hope to go away here with a learning about how, if it's possible at all, right? Um, and what the challenges are, particularly with Japanese law, So on the side, if I get to slow, you can play the stay stuff that you've heard before. Um, you can also play around, it's online right now. Um, and I'm going to give you a live uh, presentation, uh, just uh, because uh, that's usually giving a good impression of what you're talking about here, what you can do, just get a feel for that. Um, you can also go there, it's on Amazon.nexon.tech, and the newest version actually is on uh, this point, just .next on tech. I have no idea, because as always, we have programmed until the last minute. Literally, um, to get everything uh, up, to, up to date uh, and as powerful as possible. I cannot show everything a bit. What is going on there is basically on the left hand side, uh, you see Lexon, you see the code, the human readable code, and while you're writing it on the right hand side, you can get Solidity or actually, yeah, that's Solidity. No. Yeah, that's Solidity. Um, we also have a tab now for Sophia, which is another blockchain eternity. Uh, very good technology in my view, um, who are uh, also going to be a target platform for what Nexon does. And you can see, uh, so there's, there's a lot of work cut out for us. At the moment we're trying a lot of things to, to understand uh, what the focus is going to be going forward. But I would just like to, uh, without further ado, try to, uh, try to lose the focus again. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. If anybody has a tip for me, how you can switch back out of full things presentation to other stuff without embarrassing yourself, might be. Teach me how to. Yeah, yeah, just takes a minute. And then you so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Solidity popping up, and uh, I'm going to explain a little bit on the slide 
how a uh, lexon contract works. So it always starts with the keyword lex. And also that is uh, part of the debate uh, about what, what it actually should, should that keyword be like this. And, uh, so even that is a worth of discussion, right? In this, uh, in this quest to try to make something that is going to be acceptable to judges in the end. Uh, and that works for more than the right. For now, that's the rule. Like it always starts with Lex, and then it has a name, and this name is basically there for managing the file, uh, filing. Uh, but on the blockchain, you would have a uh, pointer to what actually the addresses that you want to get at when you actually want to interact with that contract. Can you so, blow up the view? Can you, blow, can you blow up the font size? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So then. I have an opportunity to uh, make definitions. And that is something that is actually something Eliza used to. You have an head of the um, our contract very often, uh, a section that is explaining very much what the individual names in the contract mean. And And what you see on the right hand side is how, how basically it's building on the fly, it's building solidity. And for the uh, technical, uh, this is uh, WebAssembly running in the browser, so the compiler itself translates to WebAssembly, it's all loaded in the browser, that's why it's nice and fast. Um, it's also pointing towards what else we're going to do, because there are blockchains out there like Infinity or also Popular and such, um, that is going to be a WebAssembly play where, um, of course, we are talking about having a substrate um, blockchain that has a virtual machine running Lexon that uh, program in Rust. So that's where we are with that. So now we have definitions up there. We have this head, we have definitions, and these definitions also, right? There we're talking about how this can be done in a way so that it's more like a template than lawyers actually used to. For now, this is how it works. Now we say in this example we have the payer is setting everything up. And the logic is that if they're just not gonna play ball, right? They're just not gonna so the pair um, basically um, oh, the first pair pays something. Pays an amount into an escrow. Appoints the arbiter. Also appoints the payee, and that's this is uh, how I like to observe. I mean, this is really already where a smart contract is more powerful than a situation other, as we're used to how it's done, because. This means nobody can run away with the money, right? The money, because of how we will program the rest, is just going to be going to the payer, payee, but never to the arbiter. So the arbiter is not going to be able to just run away with it. That also uh, fixes the fee. And this is basically the silence. So this sets up the situation. This, set, this is what happens when the contract actually is set in motion, when it comes to instance of a contract, because what we're doing here, obviously, is the cookie Cutter for a lot of different contracts that you could imagine, where you have different pairs, different payees, and so on. But always when this contract becomes an actual contract, this is the first thing that happens on the blockchain, but also, so to say, in the real world. And now, um, the main functionality of this contract is basically uh, a payout, right? So we want to be able to say that the arbiter is the one uh, who also earned the fee. may do something and nobody else may do something to know that the button that is going to be created for the payout the functionality should only be shown when it's the arbiter who's not and will be doing his balance. Right? So and this this goes on. This is like 
you can take the entire clause of the other of the, of the payout as a description for that button. Because this source code is like the perfectly self-commanding source code. It doesn't go beyond that, right? The command and the source is the same thing. So what you end up with is you have a, a lot of a lot more powerful way to create a generic interface to actually then interact with these contracts. And that is all because the entire process of translating a license contract, of compiling it into Solidity, is happening on a higher level than what usual programming does. Um, I've written about this, there's a paper I'm happy to share um, that is arguing that because lexicon stays on a higher level, like closer to human language, it really has a structure like subjects, and objects, and uh, verbs, which is a really different concern in those structures that are used to translate that into something else than what you usually have in a program language. Usually in a program language you have a tree that has the logic of, as you can see on the right hand side actually, um, you have stuff where message dot sender, so you have message and your sender and then stop operator and then still reference because message is an object and sender is a, an element and an object and so on. And that's what internally the compiler is concerned with that translates solidity. Well, the compiler that's concerned with translating Lexon actually is talking about the payer, pays, and amount. And that is actually what the business logic is, what we think about. Please. So, the, uh, is there a reason why you wrote the arbiter may pay from an escrow without including the if? The, the, the if some condition happens, the conditional, because it's it's starting to create a conditional, I think, but you don't actually have it specified. Would you have to then later on add the conditional of what when it would execute? Okay, thank you for that question. Because uh, to clarify, these are the recitals, right? They are. Are you a programmer? Oh, I uh, yeah. So they're basically the constructor, right? They are what is executed the moment that you say, okay, now I want to make this a real contract. Now I'm going to say, who is the pair? What's the name? What's the street address? What's the blockchain address? So it becomes one real instance of one contract. And in that moment, the recitals are being basically being executed, and that is that line. Which means, like, and I, I wish I... Um, yeah. um, which means that you basically can, when you... One, you can use that for other contracts too because it might be a very generic uh, code that you have created. But the recitals are basically what have to happen the moment that it becomes one concrete contract. And this is why it's not really a test. The if, of course, is part of this. Okay, if you want to make this a real contract, do this. But that's outside the realm of programming or a contract. It's just a contract that happens. But yeah, we know we can step and enter into this contract. But then to enter this contract, what has to happen is this. So um, the may, though, in the, in the payout, that is much more of a condition. And it's actually what it actually is, is um, a condition for it's, it's access control, basically. Right? Who is allowed to even go and uh, ex ever execute this function from the vantage point of the smart contract of the program? But also, who is even having this option, like on the legal side, when you look at it as a legal contract? And that's something actually we have discussed, had a lot of discussions about, um, because it's really it's different, right? A smart contract works with incentives. A smart contract cannot go beyond the blockchain and try to enforce something that didn't happen just because you wrote in the contract somebody shall, or must, or should. So, to really articulate contracts that make sense to put on the blockchain, you would pretty often try to reverse the logic of a normal legal contract. That would usually just say, okay, you have to must do this or that, or given that this is fulfilled, then this should happen. In this case, you just give the option. And hopefully, the fee was high enough that the arbiter is feeling incentivized to actually do what they may do. But if they don't, then this contract actually is not saying that the arbiter is not going to jail or whatever, it's being punished. But it's just nothing's going to happen. And that is also how a blockchain contract works. Of course, you can now 
create a stake, right? You could create a version of this contract where you say, okay, the auditor first has to pay in a stake. So we are sure that they're going to lose money if they don't act as we want them to act, right? So it's a whole different deal. And yes, of course, you could totally do this. It is a good example for next steps of this thing. Yeah? What is the Lexon manager? So yeah, that's uh, where I'm, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, let me real quick go one step back and then I, I'll, I'll go one step forward. So I wanted to show um, that it's pretty easy to um, to go and extend Lexon programs, right? Using Lexon in practice is going to be a lot about having templates and learning from those templates to extend them and to uh, adapt them to what you really want. So as an exercise, if somebody feels courageous, I just copy paste it. Uh, obviously, the compiler doesn't like it. Uh, what would I have to change now in this second clause where it says pay out again to make this, well, basically an uh, opportunity for the author to also decide to give the money back to the payer? Because let's say in the real world, the business didn't happen as it was planned. So, nobody, well, oh, few people in this room ever program Texan but I'm sure you can still tell me just intuitively what I have to change and it's really just common sense, right? So what's wrong there? You just think English. What has to change in the second clause? What's your, what's your equivalent to a Boolean? You need to declare some sort of Boolean and then say dependent on that. Well, listening to you, I mean, you sound a lot like a programmer. Maybe you think like a boy, right? Or decision. <laughs> uh, well, hey, uh, change the name to payback okay. instead of payout. Take that. We have a different name. Instead of being to themselves, it would be to the payer. Like this. May I pay the match go to the payer? To themselves and then pay becomes payer. Yeah, I take that one. Oh, okay. Right. So let's, that's all it takes. Oh, okay. And yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. Obviously, it's pretty, yeah. pretty much based on common sense. And I mean, thank you guys for basically uh, demonstrating that Nexon is not easy for programmers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must say, I mean, I don't do that now, but neither lawyers nor programmers really love this. Um, I'm pretty happy that somebody very early on of a very um, well-known law firm in the blockchain space told me, yeah, yeah, lawyers don't like it, but their bosses are going to make them use it. And likewise, with programmers. Programmers think this is verbose, this is too complicated. Um, we're, we're quite happy with our curly braces and colons and semicolons and so on, right? It makes sense to us. And it's by definition not really a lead for a language for non programmers, for programmers, because they're not non programmers. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just thinking is there a way or an idea to do it the other way around, from solidity to like some? Yeah, thank you. That's that's a that's a very interesting question. So, and this question comes up uh, because a lot of people have a lot of investment in solidity contracts, and um, it makes us, it makes a lot of sense to think about that. But it does highlight what the difference is between Lexon and Solidity. The thing is that, of course, all the information that you have on the left hand side is on the right hand side somehow, but it has been baked down to a level that mixes this with other stuff that is part of what you also have to do in Solidity, so it works, like external, right? Or, um, yeah, the address, address bracket this, closing bracket dot balance is what you actually have to write if you want to, that money that is there in that contract, right? You can just write escrow or something, but you have to write the this, and it's fine. That's how long as in Solidity, however, you would be hard pressed to find a way to look back at what the actual business logic was and what is the requirements that the language just asks for you because it just has to be done. Obviously, you're able to guess it or know it in this translation process to solidity. It gets lost there. Is this higher level, the clarity of the higher level of the information that I was referring to that Lexon is dealing in objects and subjects and verbs actually really? And to get that back out of solidity, you'd have a very hard time. I'm guessing, I'm guessing it would be possible. But it would be easier to just write 
rewrite the stuff the next time. Um, something that, that also actually is uh, sometimes happening when I make a mistake when uh, writing a Lexon contract. Um, people catch me because, uh, like, if you're a mistake, I usually do, um, and I'm, I just, I just hate it. I don't like manipulation, so I'm not really good at faking it, but sometimes I write this, right? I wrote person three times, so I write, he's a person. And of course, the audience always catches me. And to let, the last time I did it, they, they actually proposed I should write him out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they even guess the language right. Right? Because it's so simple. But what I found interesting as a programmer is that actually people, people now can catch errors in the program using their normal language set. If it doesn't read right in English, it's probably a bug. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Because even as programmers, our language center, we use that all the time, right? So that's really, I mean, it just it jumps at you. You don't think about language or about English or anything. You just have a feel, oh, it doesn't read right. And on the right hand side, right, if I would, uh, whatever it is, I'm going to see if I write a mountain back here, on the right hand side, it's a UN. That's exactly the stuff you have to look up if, as a programmer, you know a lot of different languages. Because that's, that's, Slightly different every next language. Sometimes it's a UN, sometimes it's as spelled out as unsigned. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it doesn't even exist, it's just hinted and written out, it's spelled out. It's always the same, you know exactly what it is, it just has different names and different languages. And you cannot, as a layman, criticize or jump in and say, oh, that's probably, that's probably a mistake. If I write something else other than you win, or if I write you win, you have no opinion about whether that's right or wrong. So that's a very interesting side effect that, that I found. It was certainly not intended, but uh, this kind of stuff keeps keeps coming up. With this um, uh, yeah different way of running programs. So going oh uh, I wanted to I don't know, don't know what happens because I just changed the program on the. they can read those smart contracts themselves. So in the end, it's also, 
it's also taking on a current way that business models work in the blockchain world where basically a startup is formed around a complex smart contract that is very generic and is going to or is supposed to work in very different situations and then basically the startup is a provider of the service that is created around a smart contract. Exxon is very much um, democratizing that too in the sense that hopefully a Lexon writing a Lexon contract, writing a bespoke Lexon contract that does exactly what you want becomes so easy that you will not need these new startups, right? So that's that's another, uh, I think, important aspect. Uh, aspect uh, what, what's the motivation what's behind this? Um, you had a question, sorry. Yeah, so obviously, you know, smart contract is just sitting there on the blockchain. Anyone can interact with it through Geth or whatever. How, you know, how is one put on notice that they are dealing with a smart contract that came from a Lexon legal contract, such that their interaction with the smart contract is, you know, basically the, indicating their consent to be bound by that legal contract. Ah, oh, that's a very good question. Thank you. So, um, the situation back is right now, right, is that usually you do not, you do not even have a chance to uh, understand what the source code was if you don't have this ability, because it doesn't compare back. So that points towards, at some point, uh, I think it's going to be very important to have a virtual machine of Lexon, where one of the attributes is that you can compile Lexon code onto the blockchain, but you can also decompile it back out. So there cannot be the situation that somebody is asked to interact with this contract, but doesn't have any way of knowing. Uh, Blockchain Explorer, Blockchain Explorer, so this kind of virtual machine would have the ability to just uh, press a button and say, yeah, this is, a, and this is actually the code. This is one of the aspects why the way that we show it now, where we compile it to Solidity and then from Solidity we compile it onto Ethereum, is not the last word. Right. It works now very well to make people understand that it actually has the full uh, part, but um, this is, this is one of the, and there, there's other stuff, like reversibility of individual contracts without doing your work. Right? Because judges can change history. Right? They can just say, well, yeah, actually, this contract should have never been done. Right. Or, well, let's strike this out as if it had never happened, right? And then what do you do? Yes. Yeah, so I did notice there's certain rules that you're following when you're writing the Lexon thing. Like, every sentence is ending with a period. Right. Um, when you're defining variables, it's in quotation marks. So there's a there's certain lexicon that's required in order for it to be able to convert. Mm -hmm. Does it does it flag like you forgot your period for an average person? Uh, yeah, um, actually, we did that on the side, right? It's not good yet, but we're working to uh, make the compiler be as helpful as possible. Now this is a big topic in programming and editing, right? The Rust compiler really is very advanced on this. The it really almost tells you what you should have programmed. It's, Instead of what you try to write, um, there are other compilers of a famous even C plus plus also has a long evolution behind it, and this is definitely something from day one that it was very important to me to have error messages that are as good as possible. It's a little bit something of a luxury thing in the sense that there are a lot of stuff that we have to test out that we have to de-risk first whether stuff actually works, and if it works, then you can be pretty sure that with that work you will also have this kind of problem. But we been uh, very usually aware that we want to have as much of context help, like in the clips in the program Java and auto uh, completion as well. Yeah. Yes? When it comes about parsing complexity, like, uh, do you have like long term vision? How would you like to direct the evolution of the lexicon? Like, the natural languages uh, have this like contextuality that. It's like backwards and forward in the parsing. Uh, what makes it like almost impossible task to <laughs> to implement like the proper way of handling this. So do you like to bring maybe this feature of the language that when I have a sentence, it carries on the context from the previous sentences, or but maybe you decide to drop on a feature to refer to the future sentences because of some way, or you just leave it now on the side because you would like to focus now on the basic use cases and see how it will evolve. Like I'm curious where you stand and what's the current state and what are the next steps. Yeah, so um, the, 
the basic premise of what we're doing here is called controlled language. The idea has been around for quite a while, actually. Um, and there, there are even papers that are basically pointing out that this should be possible. Um, we are doing very normal compiler work on the basis of not going forward and proposing a new grammar, but instead going back using an existing grammar, English in that case, and paring it down to a degree where we can actually parse it and create a uh, AST out of it, an abstract syntax tree, and then do other stuff with it. For example, creating solidity, or Sophia, and so on. For this, we can, and that's, that's, a, that's the major premise, basically. We can we basically pare down the possibilities of English to something that still sounds English enough, right? But will not allow you to just go overboard and create arbitrarily complex sentences, or even sentences where you decide to arrange words in a very different order than normal stuff like this. Because we have to, and I actually uh, managed to get lost in <coughs> Screen switching again, but uh, actually there's. Uh, I, I have uh, in the presentation I have a grammar uh, section where I'm just showing how this looks, how this actual file looks. That is giving you um, for for us as programmers that contains the information that is going um, that is that is eventually being sort of say the blueprint of how the computer understands language and what it is looking for. Um, what keywords it's looking for, what kind of patterns it is looking for, to be able to then construct out of that a structure that it allows you to, to really uh, have a understanding within the computer, so to say, of what um, the language is. So, and with this, Uh, I'm skipping over this here in the interest of time. Um, yeah, this is the grammar actually. So this is a uh, file just scrolling it through. Um, it's not too long, but this is how you articulate what you actually want. So, um, for example, we have statements, right? There's a number of statements, and that's the list of the <coughs> statements that I understand. Then you have the definition that clause is just uh, that you see there in, in uh, so the fast, but there are certain keywords that you see in quotes, and that's actually the, the keywords that's understanding, right? And that's exactly what I want to close with to with an open discussion about is this thinkable for Jap Japanese? Right? Is this something where the Japanese grammar is giving you obstacles that you will probably not be able to go through? Or um, is it worth giving it a step to also create a lexicon that is uh, based on the Japanese language? So uh, what I was showing uh, earlier, um, could this work? This is what I'm really stoked about, and uh, I would like uh, those who uh, say that they uh, can speak Japanese uh, to chime in and, and educate us uh, if they feel that what we do here with English is something that could also work with Japanese. There's no right or wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear opinions and reasons why or why not. Yeah, hi. Um, I was thinking, because um, you talked about controlled language, so a couple of things. One is that, did you think about as an inspiration IBM's Easy English, you know, like things like that, or technical specifications which are being be used? And the other thing is the problem that happened with controlled language, and this is a matter of debate in linguistics, which is because it is a natural language, controlled language, if there is a later a dispute, can you not go back and claim, it's not my fault, it's the language is like that, I thought I meant it this way, but it was not like that. Like, and because you cannot do it, you know what I was saying, some of the nuances of a natural language, would it not limit the kind of contracts you can write in it? Well, let me restate my question. What we do with English, do you think we can do this with Japanese?
Um, what do you think? So what do you think, what do you feel the challenges would be in Japanese? Structure. They have these particles, like you, you have the wa there before the comma. Um, so you can basically kind of use those as anchor points to figure out what the code is going to be. In fact, this has even more specificity than. Remember my question earlier about may. May can be can be permission, but it could also mean the conditional, which is for me first thing that came to mind was conditional, rather than the permission. This is very clear the permission. The Japanese itself that you're used here, shiharu o koto ga dekimasu. That specific Japanese is talking about they have the right to do something. Right. Um, and so that level of specificity, as long as the, the person writing it knows what the rule is, that you have to use this koto ga dekimasu, as long as you're using that, then it could very easily be read in. Thank you. So eventually, like one language can be the shelling point of all uh, legal coding. Instead of English, everybody calls in Japanese and all the other code. Well, actually, uh, uh, if I remember right, uh, the American jurisprudence uh, was uh, there was a lot of French used in America because people thought it was less ambiguous and you get better quality of law by articulating it in French. So yes, you could end up finding that certain languages are better than others to articulate law. And, but that's a huge debate, right? Lawyers will tell you, no, no. Uh, language has to be ambiguous. It has to be ambiguous with laws. While Nick Sabo is going to tell you, well, that's actually why I invented this term. Um, because my contracts was, the, the whole point about it was have less ambiguous contracts. Right? So it's a debate. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the only challenge, like for example, this shiharao koto ga dekimasu. That could be written as shiharaimas with a, kind of a shorthand version. And so the person who's writing it needs to know they have to adhere to certain things rather than using shorthands. Yes. And Japanese also has sometimes a combination of two characters, which could be replaced with one character with a longer thing. So like gakushu suru versus narao. So narao means to learn, gakushu means to study. But they both fundamentally mean like the same thing in English. Um, but one is a pairing of two words together. The other one is one separate word with more hiragana with it. So as long as the person typing it knows the rules, you could actually easily convert it. But there's two ways of writing verbs. Sentaku suru versus erabu. Um, to choose something, right? But as long as you know you could use, you should combine it with the two verbs plus something else, then it's, I think it's very easily convertible. Okay, so this is super interesting and helpful. I would like to invite everybody to join us on Friday, um, where we are actually going to have um, from uh, 2 to 7. Um, it's also on, uh, on Eventbrite uh, with the um, Off Death uh, um, events. Um, yeah, it's, it's a moment, at the moment it's on a waiting list, but uh, please just sign up at any rate if you should have time on Friday to continue that debate. And I'd be uh, very interested to find out whether the possibilities that we're hearing about here, uh, what the what the challenges might actually be, go 
going forward and going there towards maybe doubling your load and uh, in the next maybe you can get into the point where you uh, you can start having the kind of the tests and a lot of stuff like the project that I just wrote there and I was just wrote there I haven't kind of translated yet but it could be a great starting point so um, well, I'm having uh, trouble convincing my computer doing what it should do. Uh, I would like to say uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming here. Uh, if there are any questions, then I'm happy to answer that. Uh, I guess I, was, I can be here for another five minutes, I think. Um, it was very, uh, very interesting. It was very, very encouraging to hear that uh, it's actually a lot. Maybe unlikely because you need to attend to these two.